The theme of this year's conference is the Empowered Educator, and uh, it's really key that we found this idea from our keynote speaker who is speaking today, uh, Simon Bates, who is the Associate Provost Teaching and Learning at the University of British Columbia, framed a really interesting idea. Way back 2014, I saw him speak at BCIT when I was there in 2016, and he called it the attributes of the 21st century educator. And for us at eCampus Ontario, it really resonated with what is needed and what is missing in our institutions, and that is a real sense of digital fluency that instructors, faculty members, and the whole institution staff dedicated to teaching and learning needs to have to be successful in a rapidly changing environment. Simon uh, is a tenured professor in, of teaching in the physics and astronomy department uh, as a passionate champion for evidence-based and technology-enhanced approaches. Simon continues to teach an introductory physics course, co-teaching with different faculty colleagues each year. Recent innovations in these courses have been in the introduction of student-generated learning and assessment content and the use of open educational resources as digital content. UBC and UBC's physics department have been pioneers in the open education movement. He has received teaching awards from both the University of Edinburgh, 2006, 2011, and UBC, 2016. Prior to his current appointment, Simon served as academic director of UBC's Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology, a central academic support unit, where he oversaw the provision of academic support services to the teaching and learning community, providing an implementation pathway for all of the strategic uh, projects emerging at the University of British Columbia. Please join me in welcoming a great colleague, Simon Bates. Thank you, David, for those uh, kind words. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it really is a, a pleasure and a privilege, frankly, to be asked to uh, open with this keynote at the start of what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating series of discussions and presentations. Um, I'm just going to skip through a few of David's slides that he forgot. So maybe I could do these. This is, this is the program. You all know this anyway, because it's in your, uh, this is where you are. Um, <laughs> I love the fact, I, I, I said to someone, this could be the most Canadian swag for a conference with, with an eCampus Ontario toque. Uh, I am inspired messages. Leave completed messages in the rooms. More of the program at a glance. We'll get to my stuff in a minute, don't worry. Um, Okay, these are all the, that really is quite um, overwhelming. When I looked at the, the list, uh, as Franco said, of both colleges and universities that are represented within the, the eCampus Ontario network, and I'm sure there's representation from most, if not all, of those institutions uh, today. A word cloud represent, I feel like I'm giving you a talk, David. Um, and the Extend folks who've been so, um, proactive in producing a lot of the resources. All right, this is my stuff. <laughs> so can we reset the timer, please, so that I can have my full? Um, no, it really is a, a, a privilege and an honor, and also slightly overwhelming as well, because as David said, uh, this all started many years ago uh, in a talk that I gave in 2014 and I'll talk a little bit in a few minutes about the, uh, the sort of genesis of the, the idea for this, uh, what I called it at the time, the anatomy of 21st century uh, educators. And, you know, I know I'm speaking or singing to the choir here, but I'm going to say it nonetheless. It really is a testament to the power and purpose of open education, of open resources, and that kind of mindset built on sharing and collaboration. Um, because if I laid out the plan or the blueprint for this framework, it really has been built into a fantastic collection of resources and can be further extended through the fact that it's openly licensed now. 
Um, so it's, it's just, I can't tell you how wonderful it is and how um, fulfilling it is to see that idea be taken and shaped and, uh, and expanded upon. All right, so this is what I'd like to, uh, to cover in the next 35 minutes or so. I'll do my very best to leave time for questions at the end. Uh, I want to start with the theme for the conference and get some feedback from you uh, on your thoughts about empower empowering educators. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit, I won't go into too much historical detail about where the, uh, where the idea for the anatomy came from. Spend a little bit talking about what's not in the framework, um, but really the main part of my talk is this idea of pathways to institutional support. So what are the ways in which institutions can take the elements of this framework and use them to build, refine, and shape the support and priorities to really empower educators to deliver outstanding educational experiences for students? So, I want to start, there's an awful lot of you here, and I don't know many of you. I know some of you, but not many of you. So, I'd like to get some feedback from you to start with. So, this is your chance to legitimately use your phone during the presentation, or laptop, or any connected device. Uh, I'm using a tool called Mentimeter. Some of you have probably seen it before. Uh, if you go to the website, menti.com, uh, and then it should ask you for a code, 51276. You should find yourself with a question like this. So this is a warm-up question. They do get more difficult. Um, just give us a sense of who's here. How would you characterize your role? You know, the physicist in me can't help but love the way that they've actually got the physics of the balls colliding quite accurately, you know. Apologies to the people. Um, I did my very best to imagine the roles of people who would be here. And rather than just putting a category that says other, um, I did try to put my no role is not one of these. So to the 12 or 13 people in that category, uh, feel free to find me after the talk and say, my role is this. You should have put this as a, as a category. OK, so um, faculty, staff, in learning support or technology roles, about two to one compared to faculty. Some students, yay. I know we've got a student panel tomorrow afternoon and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to that. But an interesting mix, administrators, about the same as faculty, uh, but the largest constituency group is, is staff in a variety, I imagine, of learning support roles. Okay, that was the easy warm-up question. It's quite compelling, actually, just to watch it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think you can only vote once, so we are going to see the, the balls dry up in, uh, in a few minutes. OK. Um, everyone wants to be the last one zooming in from the side. All right, next question. Um, I'm interested in getting a sense in this theme of empowering educators or becoming empowered educators. I'd like your input on what you think are the biggest barrier at your own institution, it's completely anonymous, I'm not gonna be able to single anybody out and find out who, the, who they are and what their institution is. Um, but what you think are the biggest barriers, and I'm just going to mute that for a second. And I think the, the sort of extra description says, and how would you overcome some of these challenges? And I'll just give you a moment to uh, to think about that. If you have multiple barriers, I think this system will allow you to uh, put in uh, more than one choice. It also comes with a very sophisticated profanity filter. So uh, in many languages, including emojis, I have no idea how you swear in emojis, but I'm pretty sure someone could figure it out. Okay, let's uh, go back and have a look. Lack of time. Okay, so time is coming up. Lack of policy, faculty buy-in. Money, IT department, 
Oh, it's a good job this is anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> Old dogs, new tricks. No time, lack of administrative support. Oh, disappeared. Oops. Recognition, I saw going past there. Development time. Resilience to technology. Willingness to engage. I don't know why it keeps refreshing quite so much. It's probably because I'm trying to do this with 200 people. Culture disruption. Faculty having enough time. So time workload is a real theme that's coming out. Um, I think it keeps scrolling up to the top, doesn't it? What I can do um, uh, is make this, I can download it afterwards and, and tweet it so we can have a look at it. Um, cranky educators. <laughs> See, once people feel comfortable in it being anonymous, you get the really true stuff coming out. Um, now, having surfaced many of these challenges, I have to say, uh, I'm not going to pretend to um, address many or any of them in the next 30 minutes or so. But I do think it's important at the start of a session like this to be able to bring forward some of these challenges. Doubtless, they will come up in conversations and presentations over the next, uh, the next day and a half. Uh, but there's some really interesting themes there in terms of time and money and cranky faculty or educators. All right, thank you for that. You do get another chance for uh, a small piece of interactivity in a few minutes. But that y the next one will not require the use of your phones, just your brains. Um, so a little bit of detail about where the, where the anatomy came from. As, as David said, it originated in 2014. Um, I moved to UBC from the University of Edinburgh in 2012. And when I arrived at UBC, we were having a lot of conversations about how do we balance the disciplinary content and knowledge and skills of the discipline that students acquire in their academic programs with a broader set of skills for the 21st century, if you like, the sorts of skills that they will need in jobs, in different environments they find themselves post-graduation. And, and we in many institutions were sort of grappling with where's, this, where's the right balance, balance point. What I did find, there was a real lack of conversation about what are the skills and attributes that faculty will need to be able to change the way they approach teaching and learning with a particular focus on technology, because that's my, my sort of background in, uh, in education and education research. There was a real dearth of conversations about what are the skills and competencies and attributes that faculty need. So it's against that backdrop that in 2014, I got asked to give a talk at King's College London about some of the changing nature of uh, higher education and some of the, the forces that were, were pulling and pushing on traditional models of higher education. Uh, and I chose technology as my example of a disruptive force. Uh, and then in, in turn went on to think about, you know, what are the ways in which educators and institutions need to respond in the face of this? And I want to share with you a couple of slides that I used in that King's College talk. They're not mine, they came from Eric Grimson, a colleague from MIT. Uh, he's a professor of computer science. He had one of the first computer science MOOCs at MIT. Uh, and he had a couple of slides that I think really illustrate the pace and scale of change in technology in everyone's everyday lives, let alone uh, students' lives in higher education. So I'll show you two pictures. This is the first one. Uh, this is St. Peter's Square in Rome when the body of um, the former Pope, John Paul II, was brought out for public viewing uh, after his death in 2005. The next picture is exactly the same place eight years later uh, when the new Pope makes their first appearance. And you can look at the difference. Before, actually, you can see with good eyes, bottom right-hand corner, one person has a flip phone, <laughs> right? Eight years later, tremendous scale and pace of technology change. 
and, and in that talk, and I think it's, uh, it's available online, I can share a link later, um, what I was saying is how are we supposed to respond as educators and as institutions? And so it was from there that the very first version of the, uh, the anatomy of 21st century educators was born. And you know, reflecting back after four years, I'm not quite sure why we went for that sandy color background. Um, we had some fairly lurid colors for the icons that now I look at and think that was rather ill-advised. But you know, in the way that open resources can be developed, they were changed and made into something that's much more visually appealing, yet still retains the same, uh, the same overall structure. Uh, and I could see from David's slides as well that there's been another makeover of them. So they're now on the, uh, on the third generation. So that's really, uh, really where it came from. And it's been a useful framework in talking to my colleagues Actually, when I, I first proposed it in that talk at King's College, one of the things I said was, this is not meant to be absolutely comprehensive and complete, but it's a starting point for a conversation about what I thought was an important topic that we weren't having enough discussions on. Uh, and over the next couple of slides, I'll just share with you some feedback that I've had from people uh, about the framework as I've been, uh, been talking about it. Uh, a few people have told me, you know, there's a bunch of stuff missing from it. And that's quite right, because it was never meant to be kind of everything and all comprehensive, and particularly the affective components, attitudes, values, empathy, motivation, things like that, tremendously important for educators, but never really designed to be within that, uh, within that framework. The other sort of consistent piece of feedback that I've had is people have looked at it and said, now come on, you can't expect one person to be all of these things, right? It would make them an educational superhero. Um, well, I said, many of our institutions have people exactly like this, particularly, though not exclusively, in education-focused roles. And I'll talk a little bit more about the growth of those roles in, uh, in a few moments. But increasingly, at many of our institutions, particularly in the early years, we have large classes and teaching now more than ever before is a team sport. So even if you don't think about these attributes and skills all within a single person, it's a useful framework to think about when you're putting together a team and you're building the composition of skills that a team, I think, needs for designing a new program or initiating a curriculum redesign or thinking about new ways to reach different learners through online education. I think one of the things for me anyway that's meant that this framework has sort of stood the test of time and we still, we still use it uh, is the sense that it operates across multiple length scales. And what I mean by that is it obviously works at the level of an individual educator, because you can look at particularly the resources that have been created through uh, the eCampus Ontario uh, work, and you can immediately see the relevance to your own practice as an educator or in terms of supporting educators. Um, but I think it's also a useful framework in thinking about the way units with responsibility for supporting teaching and learning, and even institutions, how they set their direction or priorities for teaching and learning. Uh, it's a useful framework when applied at, uh, at that level. And that really is the sort of main thing I wanted to talk about this afternoon. It's really to try, try and offer some insight into trying to answer that question. How might an institution build, deploy structures to realize the development, refinement, and support of these capabilities amongst faculty and staff. So it's not just for faculty. These are skills that in many of our institutions, uh, the faculty and the educational enterprise is supported by uh, a whole range of professional staff roles. Um, so I'm not gonna have the time to go through all six because I don't have, the, uh, I don't have that amount of time. I've chosen three and what I'll do is I'll share examples from my own work at UBC, not to say this is the way 
that you should do it because, of course, uh, context is tremendously important across institutions. And if we're being honest, even within different parts of the same institution. But there are ways in which I think we've been able to make some progress uh, in aligning priorities and strategies in a way that supports the, the, the various elements of this framework uh, to make some, uh, some really, important, uh, really important changes. So we'll dive into to the first one. I was absolutely delighted to see that the basis for the resources within the teacher for learning element was based around how learning works. I'm sure many, many people in this room are very familiar with this book. Uh, in case you're not, this slide offers three kind of routes in. There's a one-page summary from the Carnegie Mellon website, which is where uh, Marsha Lovett, one of the authors, uh, several of the authors actually, are based. There's a two-page summary from uh, Richard Felder, who's a professor of chemical engineering, who's done an awful lot in engineering education. He's written some fantastic uh, resources to support STEM education and also relevant more broadly. Uh, I used one of them a few weeks ago in my first year class. Uh, he has a short article called Memo to Students Who Were Disappointed with Their Last Grade. And it's fantastic because it's basically a series of questions. And his argument is, do whatever you have to do to answer yes to as many of these questions as possible. Because in order to answer yes, you have to be doing productive, educational, you know, deep learning uh, activities. Anyway, two-page summary from Richard Felder. And, and we also um, wrote a, a slightly more expanded five-page summary of these seven principles, which if you know the book, you will know they're very discipline agnostic. One of the things I really like about the book is they start each chapter with two completely different case studies. The disciplines could not be more different. And they look very, very different on the surface. But as you work through the text of the chapter, you actually find out that the issue or the problem, because these, these synopses or vignettes are often framed in terms of a problem an instructor is having, uh, they turn out to be fundamentally the same thing at the root cause. So it's a very, very nice way of looking past sort of disciplinary perspectives. Um, we've used this extensively at, at UBC. We've built a lot of our sort of professional development programming. Uh, when I was academic director of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology, we've used it to develop a lot of that programming. We've worked hard to find ways to, you know, there you've got the one page summary everyone should be able to read one page. One of my colleagues said, nope, you've got to make it shorter. <laughs> so there you go. We came up with seven words and seven icons. That's the whole of how learning works uh, in, in seven pictures. And unlike the others, I'm still quite pleased with these icons, even five or six years, uh, five or six years later. Um, one of the things I wanted to share with you is, um, We've done a number of workshops and activities where we actually get faculty and staff in and work through various elements or principles uh, as part of how learning works. And I want to share with you an exercise uh, that we do under principle two, and that's the idea of knowledge structure. And if you're not familiar with, with the book, the basic idea is, the principle is that how students structure and organize their knowledge turns out to be very, very different from how experts organize their knowledge. And furthermore, the way students organize their knowledge has profound impacts on how they can retrieve and apply that knowledge under different learning situations. And to illustrate the, the sort of difference between how novices and experts structure their knowledge, I have a little exercise for you. So some ground rules before we do the exercise. First of all, if you've seen it before, please play along nicely. Don't spoil it for your table. Secondly, no writing things down. No cell phones taking pictures, like the, uh, uh, the picture that I showed you earlier. And, and finally, if you think you can get around this because you downloaded the slides, 
that I tweeted at the start of this talk. These slides aren't in it. So this is, this is a little Easter egg just for people who are here. Um, so that's the ground rules. I'm going to show you a key for a numerical code, the numbers 1 to 10. I am going to show you the key and leave it up there for 30 seconds. And you need to memorize the key because a little bit later there will be a recall test on what you can remember from the key. Okay? Here's the key. I get a great view up here who's trying to write things down behind their papers without being seen. go 30 seconds is not a long time is it about 30 seconds I didn't time it exactly but a few more seconds won't really help you actually um, okay so that key is now all committed to memory here's the recall task if I was being really unfair I'd do another five minutes of talking and then do the recall task here's the recall task write down your phone number in the symbolic code. <laughs> Mobile, landline, office, whatever. It's hard, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I will, uh, I'll give you a few more seconds and then I'll let you do some self-assessment and you can see how many digits you actually got right. Okay, there's the code again. If you want to honestly give yourself a mark out of 10 for how many digits you got right. And anyone who claims 10 out of 10 because their phone number is 555555555. It's five that a lot of people can remember, right? Because it's, it's quite five or zero is what a lot of people can remember. All right, so um, most people's phone numbers will be 10 digits. Show of hands if you got five or more digits correct. Six digits, let's just cut to, who got all 10 digits? No, oh, okay, a few here, right. Um, I could ask if these people have seen it before, but I won't. One of the challenges you're running up to here is I'm giving you more pieces of information than you can reasonably store within your working memory, right? So you're trying to encode 10 different pieces of information. And this is what novice learners often do, particularly when they're getting to grips with new subjects, new terminology, or new ways of thinking about things. One of the things that experts can do very, very efficiently is chunk information. So they don't remember small pieces, they remember more holistic chunks. It means you have to encode one larger piece of information and it keeps more working memory capacity free. I'll show you the chunk that is the way to remember this code. And I guarantee you will never forget how to write your phone number in this code. That's how an expert would remember this. It's a tic-tac-toe frame with a zero as the dot, right? 
But it's a really powerful example. I wish I had the attribution for this. It's not my exercise. Uh, it was shared with me some years ago by a UBC colleague. We tried to find out who came up with this because I would love to be able to, uh, to attribute it, and we, we, we don't know as yet. But it's a really powerful example of the way, as an expert in your discipline, you can encode information in large chunks such that you have forgotten what it's like not to know that these numbers come from a tic-tac-toe frame. Whereas if you're a novice learner and you're trying to remember what looks like 10 disconnected pieces of information that make no sense, and I'm sure some of you, when you were looking at the code, were trying to see, well, that's an L, and is it rotated half a turn that way for something that's double? And you're looking for patterns in the information, but you're not able to decode the, uh, the actual structure. It's a really nice example of how, how in, in terms of that principle, the way experts and novices structure uh, information um, it really brings it home to, uh, to, to faculty and staff when they do this. They have the same kind of emotive and almost visceral experience that you, do, you did when you show the, uh, the key and everyone goes, no, oh, come on, of course, it's really simple once you know it. Um, so for a time, I was on a mission at UBC to get that book, How Learning Works, into the hands of every single new faculty member. And one of my colleagues stopped me one day and said, it's not enough. You can give it to all of them, and they might read it, but they have to live it as well. They have to really experience what it's like to go through some of the pain and the process of learning and experimenting how to do this with a group of students. So I want to share with you a practical example of how we've worked to get faculty to really live this experience of becoming a teacher for learning if you like. Um, and it's through this approach that we call paired teaching. It's very, very simple. Uh, a novice instructor could be newly appointed, could be new to teaching in a particular school or unit, is paired with a much more experienced instructor. And the two of them co-teach a course for a whole semester. And they really co-teach it. It's not a case of I'll do the first six weeks my colleague will do the next six weeks. We're in all the classes together. We're making all the decisions about the course, the assessment strategies, the mark schemes, everything uh, together. And both of them get full teaching credit for teaching the course. So it actually costs a little bit because you're doubling up on one particular course. So we started doing this, as David said in his introduction, I've done this ever since I arrived at, at UBC. Uh, we started doing it in a few departments at UBC, and we wrapped some research and evaluation around it because we wanted to understand what effect does it have? What do people do after they've had this semester together and they, they go their separate ways? Uh, so this is work of my colleagues at UBC, Jared Strang and Linda Strubber from physics and colleagues from earth sciences as well. And they used a combination of observational techniques and structured interviews with a number of teaching pairs across UBC. And I'll show you three graphs of what they found. The first was looking at what is happening in the paired teaching classroom in terms of what is happening when the experienced instructor is leading the class and what is happening when the new instructor is leading the class. And you can see you know, the, the, the different activities there are typical of an active learning STEM classroom with clicker questions, discussion, demonstrations, that sort of thing. But broadly similar between what the two instructors are actually doing. So that's while the paired class is going on for a semester. The next thing they looked at was, I think I'm out of range, there we go. Um, what happens subsequently? Because after the paired teaching engagement, this was typically in first or second year courses, and the new instructor or the novice instructor continued on with that section the following year. So the experienced instructor left and the, the new instructor uh, was flying solo, as it were. And this is looking at what the novice instructor was doing during the paired teaching experience, what they, what they were doing subsequently a year later when they were teaching this class on their own. And again, broadly, 
similar sorts of proportions of activity. The final thing they looked at is, again, with the novice instructor, what happens in a course that was not the subject of the paired teaching activity? So this was a second course that they'd always taught alone, but this was before and after the, the paired teaching activity. And what they found across many pairs, I think this is data from uh, um, a number of pairs put together, uh, they found that there were more active learning components introduced after the paired teaching activity, even in a different course. So they transferred the sorts of things that they'd learned and got comfortable with doing in, uh, in the paired teaching activity into a different course context. And frequently this was an upper division third or fourth year course with a very, very different learning design, but they were still able to adapt uh, and change some of the ways that they approach things. So I think that's a really nice example of the ways in which you can really get faculty to live becoming a teacher for learning. And I have to say, uh, the Faculty of Science at UBC has shown tremendous leadership here in committing to offer a paired teaching experience for every new faculty member that's hired. And I just think back to when I started and my first teaching experience, you know, talk about being thrown in at the deep end and maybe Several others in the room had similar experiences. The chance to have this as a kind of 13-week intensive professional development activity with someone who could bail you out if the technology went wrong or if something went off the rails during a session. Tremendously, uh, tremendously valuable. So that's the first one. Let me run through the other ones quickly because uh, I'm conscious of time and I do want to leave some time for questions. Um, the idea of experimentation, and I want to talk here about the, the key contribution, I think, that education-focused faculty can make, and I have a plea, um, can we please stop talking about teaching only faculty, because it implies by saying teaching only, it's some kind of a deficit, there's something that we're not quite good enough to do, and it's not the case, because many people in these roles have actually made a very positive commitment and career statement to say this is what I want to do in terms of my, uh, my career. Um, so we have education focused faculty at, at UBC, as David said in his introduction, uh, I'm one of them. Um, we have a stream we call the educational leadership stream. There's a requirement for teaching service and this thing called educational leadership, which broadly construed is having an impact beyond your classroom in teaching and learning. And at the highest levels, commensurate with full professor, it's an impact of national or international standing. Um, uh, in the words of one of my, one of my colleagues at UBC, these are, these are people who get to have the whole of their desk focused on the teaching and learning mission of the university. Now, it's far from perfect. There are many challenges, and this echoes uh, some of the things we saw on the, uh, on the, the submissions from you earlier about workload, about time, about recognition, and about career prospects and advancement for faculty in these roles. But one of the things we've advocated for at UBC is people in these roles can become your catalysts for change from within a department. They are the experimenters, they are the innovators, and frequently they will have the disciplinary credibility to be able to influence the practice of their colleagues. As we were doing this and we were sort of talking about how people experiment and innovate and the influence that has on other people's practice, it became very, very apparent to me we had conflated two very distinct ideas. We'd conflated at, at UBC, we'd conflated the idea of educational management or enabling the teaching and learning functions of the university and educational leadership. Uh, so we put some time into developing this framework, uh, again with slightly dated icons, but not too bad. Uh, and what this looks at is it's trying to map, we, we called it on the, on the x-axis, the dimensions of teaching. These are the things you do as an educator. You deliver teaching experiences, you design, you develop as an educator through scholarly reflection and growth, and you may engage in scholarship and public dissemination. But that's enacted in these different forms as a practitioner standing in front of a class. 
as a manager or enabler of the institutional conditions that support teaching and learning. And in the context of experimentation, yes, you can experiment in your class, in your own teaching, we were most interested in this idea of experimentation as a leadership practice to influence and innovate and change the practice of, uh, of, of others. So there's a link there to that if you're, uh, if you're interested. It was actually part of a larger um, international network project we had as uh, a member of the Universitas 21 network. Um, but frequently, in the role that I used to have, well, the role I have now, you, you have a perspective across the entire institution and you see these people cropping up again and again, doing really innovative, experimental things that are changing the face of teaching and learning within, uh, within their discipline. Uh, so these kind of roles, I think, we see them becoming increasingly important at our own institution, and I know they're, uh, they're equally important in other institutions as well. Um, so my final one, just to, to round off quickly, I'm going to end with technology because, as I said earlier, it's a sort of particular passion of mine given my, my background. Um, supporting faculty to be, to use technology in fluent and educationally effective ways. Uh, we really rethought how we provided support for learning technology. I, I've worked in a number of institutions where there's always this question of, well, where does this really sit? Is it within the IT services department? Is it, <laughs> I'm remembering one of the comments that we saw at the beginning. Um, is it within the IT services department? Is it within the teaching and learning center? Is it within the library? Or is it some sort of messy entanglement between all three? Uh, and so rather than worrying about where do we put the decision-making authority and the budget lines for learning technology support, we set about rethinking the way we provision learning technology support. And we came up with this idea of a learning technology hub which is really for, for faculty and learning support units around the campus, a single front door where people can come and ask any questions. It doesn't matter whether it's technical, whether it's pedagogical, whether it's about a, a tool we have or a tool that they'd like to have, uh, but it's a single front door. And we bring together relevant staff from the teaching and learning center and from the IT applications team, and we physically co-locate them. We make it almost impossible for them not to cooperate because they're in the same space. Uh, and it's been a really, really effective collaboration. Um, we find that the technical folks get a much greater appreciation for the pedagogy and the educational rationale. Uh, the pedagogical folks deepen their technical knowledge as well, particularly if it's not their, their background and training. The stress test for us was uh, the move of our LMS, we moved last year from Blackboard to, to Canvas, we moved 7,000 courses, and it was done, um, the previous transition at UBC did not go particularly well, and there were subsequent uh, performance and stability issues. This was a high stakes project. One of my colleagues referred to it as a career ending project, if you get it wrong. Um, so that was the real stress test for this organization um, that we put together and touch as wood, it's, it worked pretty well. We're almost at the end of that journey. The final thing I'd say is this hub gives us new ways to think about provisioning more agile support for learning technology. Um, so UBC has something like 5,000 faculty members on the Vancouver campus. Um, they have a problem, they have a problem now. It's half an hour before their quiz is due or their lecture goes online or their assessment closes. They don't want to put a ticket into a system and be told, your ticket is very important to us, we'll get back to you in two days, right? They need someone there within 20 minutes. So we came up with this idea, Learning Technology Rovers co-op students from the disciplines who provide customized support for instructors related to learning technologies including hands-on help. They're like a rapid response force. And, and they're wonderfully subversive because they will go in and start having these fantastic conversations about pedagogy with faculty. Sometimes because they've taken the course that they're supporting faculty uh, working on. So we piloted this a few years ago with uh, just one or two faculties and now all the faculties want these learning technology rovers. And actually they were the backbone of the just-in-time support that we used for the LMS transition as well. All right, so three quick examples there of ways in which 
I think we've been able as an institution uh, to leverage parts of the framework uh, to push forward institutional priorities uh, and our goals. I'm sure we're going to hear um, many more stories that do similar things over the next day and a half, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversations. Thank you very much. And I think I've left a few minutes for questions. Uh, we have microphone runners. I've been told you need to wait until a microphone appears because this is being recorded. Yeah, one over here. Oh, you were waving at me. <laughs> no, there's one here. Hi. Uh, thanks very much. I'm wondering about the rovers. What how did you select those students? Yeah, so um, it was an open application process. Um, the first time, um, so you might think, isn't this doing the teaching and learning center out of a role here? Quite the opposite, because the role that the, the teaching and learning center has is supporting and developing this community. Um, so the first time we actually interviewed them, subsequently we had existing or previous tech rovers sit in on the interviews as well. So they were selecting students. And some of it was sort of case studies. You know, a faculty member comes to you with this kind of a a problem. What would you advise them and how would you advise them? So a little bit of role play. Because many of the students, students often think they need a very, very high technical knowledge to be able to fulfill a role like this. Uh, but of course, it's some of the other skills that um, we find they actually need a little bit more support in developing. The technical stuff's easy. We can teach them uh, that. But we're really looking for people who can sort of have those conversations with, uh, with faculty. I should say we have no shortage of applications either. They're, it's proved really, really successful. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. I'm curious, it, I'm guessing, and I don't want to assume, that the paired teaching is reserved for um, tenure track faculty or full time. Are, you, are there ways that you're looking to support sessional and adjunct instructors yeah. with a similar type of experience or training? Um, yes, uh, ultimately it's the decision of the head of department or whoever is delegated with allocating the teaching responsibilities. I would say I've, I've worked with, I'm co-teaching this year with a graduate student, uh, which is just a fabulous, fabulous experience. Uh, and previously I had taught with someone who was on a 12 month lecturer contract as well. So I wouldn't say it's rolled out to all of those different groups other than tenure track faculty. It's very much based on what what courses need taught at what time and who's available. I don't think in principle there's any problem with expanding it further though. Hello. Hi. Um, in your experience or in your research, have you seen issues with intellectual property as we see teaching becoming more of a team-based sport? Mm, yes, how long have you got? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we have, uh, as David said, we have a strong culture around open uh, at UBC. Um, he highlighted the physics department. I'd actually also point out our math department as well. Um, you know, our math department teaches something like 17,000 students a year. So a shift to open resources and open textbooks is enormous for a department like that. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, I have to be rather careful what I say because I'm being recorded. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we have colleagues who are um, fiercely protective of their content. Uh, and I would say maybe don't understand that it's already out there anyway. They think that putting it inside the LMS where it's locked down to only certain groups of students, uh, you know, precludes it from being shared in any other way. And you show them websites like Course Hero and things like that where there's thousands of pages associated with courses I've taught. Um, so it's a mixture, really. I know that's not a very satisfying answer, but I'll happily chat more when the mic's off. Hi, 
I just wanted to thank Simon on behalf of eCampus Ontario and everyone who's here today for delivering such a great kickoff keynote for us as we go forward into our sessions and start to think about some of these issues. So we have a present for you, but we'll give it to you later. So <laughs> join me, please, in thanking Simon. Thank you.